Good morning. Uh, I hope you didn't have such a great time last night that you can't stand being conscious this morning. Now here, let's memorialize you for the future. Everyone smile and relax. <laughs> Everything we do is recorded. I'm conscious of time, so I will proceed. Uh, what I'd like to speak about today are trends that are driving changes in education worldwide. Yesterday I spoke about transformations that are technological. This morning I'd like to speak about other drivers and other, and other changes in higher education. This is a shot from where I live. Uh, I'm from the United States. It was about minus 20 centigrade, which we consider a little, little chilly, not too cold. I'm going to be speaking from the perspective of the United States with a global perspective added to it. Uh, because we have quite a lot of influence on the world in the United States, and our development is actually pretty interesting. Unfortunately, we are too interesting at times. I don't know if I'll be allowed back in my country this weekend. Obviously, we've been going through some changes. So if you want to think about what's coming next with higher education, you have to examine certain trends in the present. You have to examine forces that have power to drive transformations in universities and colleges, as well as libraries and museums. That's what I'll be doing over the next few minutes. To begin with, this is based on a research project I've been doing since 2012. This is called Future Trends in Technology and Education. It's a monthly report that is based on looking at a horizon scan to look for current developments that are affecting education, mostly higher education. One of these that we have to bear in mind, and of course, for an audience like this, you know this pretty well, is the increasing globalization of higher education. This sounds like a cliche. We think about globalization at all times, but it's vital to recognize that this is beginning to change universities. So for example, over the past 15 years, we've seen an almost arms race of universities being built up and education systems being built up. You think, for example, where are the Germans here? Of course, you have the Excellence Initiative, right, where your government spent a great deal of money, billions of euros, in order to improve higher education. You can think about China right now, which is building more universities and more university capacity than any civilization in human history. You can take a look at the Middle East, which, while they still have money, is desperately trying to build up as much capacity, as many institutions as they can. And in Europe, of course, you have the higher education area, a tremendous achievement powered by the Bologna process. So we're seeing this happen on the global stage. This is unusual, especially compared to the 20th century. We're also seeing the growth of transnational students, of students moving between campuses and between nations. Some of the lead destinations include Great Britain. Canada is especially appealing to per capita basis. In East Asia, we're seeing a lot of Chinese students moving across the Pacific, but we're also seeing different nations making plays for power and for the ability to attract more students in Southeast Asia and in Central Asia. Meanwhile, we're seeing campuses build presences abroad. Uh, for example, the United States campus Yale built a liberal arts college in Singapore, which is still controversial. We're seeing the Middle East, almost shopping malls filled with different campuses from around the world. In short, our old idea of the university as regional, as national, as local, is increasingly obsolete. This is a quick screenshot of the project I was working on last night. I do a weekly video conference where we have several hundred people discussing the future of education technology. And you can tell here that we have a pretty wide global response so far. But this is the kind of network I'd like you to keep in mind. Now, meanwhile, within education, we're having policy transformations. And many of you here, especially those that work in ministries, this is obvious. But I want to put this on the table for all to consider. For example, we are experiencing a global, sustained movement to reform higher education to take college and university outcomes and improve them, to take a look at faculty and transform them. This is almost unprecedented. In European history, in North American history, we have a tradition of criticizing universities. We have a tradition of wanting them to become better. But we rarely have this kind of sustained, continuous pressure to rebuild them. One part of that 
is we're seeing the development of new pilots for certification, everything from micro-credentials to corporate certificates. The idea is to go around what universities can do. I mean, think about the challenge of that. And we see this with blockchain, the idea of taking the crown jewel of higher education, the ability to certify learning for the world to see, and to outflank that. Moreover, we're seeing the rise of new business models, new ways of paying for and supporting education. This slide alone points to a galaxy of possibilities that really change what we think of in higher education. I work as a futurist. Part of my job is to anticipate what will come next. This is very, very difficult to do. Statistically, humans are terrible at predictions. Uh, in fact, a recent book took a look at political scientists' predictions about the near-term future and found that political scientists were less accurate than a random guess. So you would be better off with a dartboard or a coin toss than with a professional prognosticator. That said, one trend that we can always look for that rarely changes is demographics. Once a population is born, there's a lot of predictive power in how they will behave over the lifetimes. Unless something truly extraordinary happens, we can bet on a lot of it. So right now, we're seeing a fascinating split in the world. The developed world, the developed nations, are aging, and their youth population is shrinking, both in relative and absolute terms. Meanwhile, their senior population, their elder population, is growing, as you can see from around this room. Uh, what this means, is fascinating. So for example, this chart is the picture of human history until the 20th century. This is a demographic analysis of the population in Nigeria right now. Every slice of this represents a chunk of the population. The very bottom is people aged 0 to 4, then 5 to 9, then 10 to 14, and so on. And you can see that this is a population that is terrific at producing children. You can think of humanity as a giant spam bot, throwing out lots and lots of children, and then mortality sets in, and year by year, decade by decade, whittles it down, until we have lots of babies, lots of kids, a good amount of middle-aged, smaller and smaller, and so on. This is what history looked like until the 20th century. This is what most of the developing world looks like. This is what the developed world looks like. Once you have several factors in place, once you have modern medicine, modern sanitation, and above all, once you have women going to school for a long time, you have fewer and fewer children and adults living longer and longer. So that pyramid is now flipped upside down. This chart, by the way, is one reason why Japan is so crazy for robots. They are running out of workers. And this is one way to replace them. It's not just Japan. This is the United States, the best predictions we have for 2020. Uh, and you can see this is a, uh, a rectangle, not a pyramid. Uh, I think of this as a refrigerator, actually. Um, and you can see that we have, uh, famously, the baby boom generation is a special color because they're the baby boom. They look at their special treatment. You can see that far from being a young country, the United States is now a middle-aged country aging rapidly. What this means for our cultures is fascinating. What this means for our economics, what this means for our politics. Here, for example, is France. And you can tell this is a country with a very healthy, middle-aged, and aging population. Here's Germany. So how do you supply an economy when you have fewer workers and fewer taxpayers? How do you pay for pensions and health care? These are some of the challenges. When it comes to education, Demographics like this say that the 18-year-old population is small and perhaps a niche market. What happens when your primary market is adult? That isn't our image of most of higher education. Last night, uh, somebody pointed out that we weren't paying enough attention to corporate learning, workforce training, vocational training. This is one reason why we should pay more attention. In the United States, I want to point out a few interesting examples that may surprise you. Uh, we have a great deal of in-migration, people moving across states. And one of the fascinating things is when you think of New York, when you think of Chicago, when you think of Boston, those are decreasingly interesting and useful. Most people are leaving those areas for the south. I know you're all fascinated by Texas. 
Uh, Texas is our leading population center. It's the only state which has a growth population of children. Uh, that changes our complexion in many ways. Beyond demographics, we can speak of economics, and there's a good reason why economics is usually called the dismal science. Several forces are changing macroeconomics at a global scale, which is changing what we do in colleges and universities. So for example, it's pretty well known that income inequality in a series of nations is increasing. Uh, this is a chart adapted from the great work of Thomas Piketty, I'm sorry, Thomas Piketty, uh, which takes a look at income inequality over the past century. And let me just break this down for a sec. <clears throat> the vertical line represents inequality. The higher the point, the more unequal. The very, very bottom would be perfect communism. <laughs> the horizontal line is time. And you could tell that the very far left, circa 1900, 1910, these countries, and this here is Anglophonic, uh, Britain, the United States, Canada, Australia, that we were excellent at income inequality. <laughs> we were very unequal. People call this the Great Gatsby curve, right? From 1910 to 1950, income inequality dropped thanks to World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, the collapse of global trade. And by 1950, we had perhaps the least unequal societies we'd ever experienced. From 1950 to circa 1980, some economists call this the Great Compression, we had the least differences by class for all kinds of reasons. Circa 1980, that trend reverses and inequality begins to rise again for all kinds of reasons which we could talk about, having to do with the growth of the financial sector, increasing trade, capital flows, and so on. But the point here is that income inequality has resumed we are now at circa 1920s levels and increasing. There are almost no forces retarding this. So you want to think, what does this mean to be in higher education? What does it mean to be at a university designed to facilitate and enhance inequality? Or do universities have the opposite mission? Are they in opposition to this? We haven't really had this conversation yet. In some countries, we are watching the erosion of the middle class, the creation of a two-tiered economic system. I had a conversation with a public university president in uh, Wisconsin. I can't tell you the university, and you'll see why. I asked him, what jobs are your graduates prepared for? And he said, I don't know. I said, oh, wait a minute. You're the president of the university. You can't not know. And he said, well, we used to have assembly line workers' children, and they were there first in their generation to have a college education to become managers. I said, well, what happened? So we don't have industry anymore. Well, what we have is the service sector. So I don't know. This is a global phenomenon in many ways. Are you all familiar with this chart? It's called the elephant chart. <clears throat> it's based on recent work by Branko Milanovic. And he was taking a look at income inequality on the global stage. And what's interesting about this, <clears throat> the very bottom left shows the income of the poorest people around the world. On the right is the wealthiest. And you can see that over time, the bottom and the middle saw a lot of their, econ their economic well-being increase. And you can see, of course, on the far right edge, that the wealthiest saw their income increase. But here, That's the middle class, and in the developed world, that's the middle and working class, who saw their income stagnate or not go forward at all or actually go backwards. That is the Trump vote, by the way, if you're looking for a single explanation. This is an interesting chart to think about. This helps shape in many ways some of the feelings of workers around the world those who are expecting and enjoying great growth and those who are seeing it not go the same way. Again, in higher education, think about what this means for the mentality of our populations, as well as for our income, our revenue, our business model, and the future we're preparing our students for. The workforce has also changed in some ways that you're familiar with, but to recap recapitulate, we are moving the developed world from manufacturing economy to a service sector. We thought we were preparing for information economy, and that didn't really come out to be true. Yes, there's a huge information sector. It makes a great deal of money. It has an enormous amount of capital. You think about companies like Huawei in China. You think about Google, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, Apple, and so forth. But they employ relatively few people. Most people are actually employed in the service sector, which represents a great transformation. 
we're also used to the idea of having, say, one person working one job for life. <clears throat> Think about the Japanese salaryman. Um, I was showing my children the TV series Mad Men, and they find this very entertaining. It's like science fiction to them. The idea that you could have one job, one career, one employer for life. That's a 20th century thing. Like privacy, we don't do this anymore in the 21st century. Instead, we prefer to have multiple jobs, multiple careers, sometimes simultaneously, what we call the gig economy. Meanwhile, while this is happening, one technological force to point out is automation. All the evidence we have shows that since 1990 or 2000, as we automate new professions, as we automate services, we do not create new jobs to replace them. This is a new transformation. It used to be that when we invented the train, it made it more difficult for people in the horse and buggy field. People rode horses less often. That was bad news for the horse drivers, but we created a massive industry to replace it. The same thing happened with the car. The same thing happened with the typewriter. But with the digital world, this doesn't happen at all. We reduce the total number of jobs. So it's possible going forward over the next 30 years that we will see fewer people work, that we may have underemployment and unemployment at a massive level. Think what that means for university graduation. Now, think as well about politics and political changes. We could spend the next four hours going into this, but let me mention a few of these. Worldwide, we're experiencing increased tensions between cities and countryside. The rural-urban split is one that is very deep and persistent. It's one that hasn't really been a subject of conversation until late. We're seeing some increased tensions of race. In the United States, People ask me, well, how, how did Trump possibly win? And here are a few of the reasons. Concerns about gender, competing models of gender equity, for example. Economic anxiety, nationalism, nativism. <clears throat> this is a different political environment than we were experiencing in the 1990s. And again, this shapes public finance of higher education. This shapes our student mentalities. Our student population is changing in some key and important ways. Uh, in the United States, we're seeing for the first time a near majority of adult learners, where the 18 to 21 sector is shrinking. We're seeing an increasing number of first generation college and university students, which again, that population has a different experience than those of people whose parents went to university. Thanks to uh, nearly 20 years of continuous war, the American campuses are thronged by veterans uh, a great deal, you couldn't tell this from most conversation about higher education, um, but it's an important aspect of our population. And we have a rise of learning disabilities. We're not sure why they're increasing, but that changes how we support learning. This slide shows a very, very different population, obviously with implications for learning. Now, I want to skip forward a little bit to some more depressing slides. One is that we have decided that full-time tenured faculty should be scarce. Uh, in the United States, we've decided to replace them with part-time non-tenured labor. This process is called adjunctification, or the casualization of economic labor. This has occurred elsewhere. Uh, in Canada, these are called sessionals. We're seeing signs of this in parts of Britain, parts of Australia. Uh, the idea is that we're turning the academic labor market into a version of the general labor market, where we have the gig economy, people working increasingly part-time. Interestingly, American studies are inconclusive as to who is a better teacher, an adjunct or a tenured professor. Meanwhile, we are continuing a practice of financializing higher education. Uh, that is, we are removing public funding and offloading funding to other people. In the United States, we have a federal system. States usually fund public education. Their contributions have been declining. Uh, some universities I work with have only 8% of their funding coming from the state. Meanwhile, we offload this into debt, and the amount of debt owed by American students is now roughly $1.4 trillion. Uh, it is greater than any form of debt in the United States uh, besides household debt, and that is expanding. So, back to politics. <clears throat> and to the Germans, thank you for this wonderful image and this wonderful cover. I mentioned nativism. I mentioned migration before. Well, this is an interesting problem. Universities are often of one particular culture that is cosmopolitan, that is universal, that is global, and they are in many ways oppositional 
to localism or nativism? Is it possible that we will see political unrest at universities opposing political forces in favor of excluding migrants? We've already seen this happen. We've seen a group of American cities and American campuses declare themselves to be sanctuaries. It is possible that over the next year, they will resist attempts to deport students. Some of my clients have already spoken that they will not share with the federal government information about undocumented students. It's possible we will see widespread unrest as the result. But it's not just that. I mean, in a larger scale, we're not sure how to sustain higher education any longer. Uh, you think about this at a few different scales. Globally, we're facing some massive levels of political dysfunction. The Panama Papers in many ways surprised few people, but documented the suspicion of widespread elite malfeasance and corruption. We're seeing widespread political unrest. The elites seem uncap incapable of managing this, as we saw with the Grexit crisis. We're also seeing widespread resentment of political elites. What happens when these forces actually grow and intersect? Think about environmental stresses. Globally, we seem convinced that global warming is something that we will participate in and encourage. We are clearly not serious about mitigating climate change. What happens when that begins to have political fallout, with economic fallout, with political fallout, with refugees driven by climate crises? What happens when politics and the environment intersect in a negative way? What happens when political unrest meets a leadership that is clearly not very capable of maintaining itself? What happens when these cycles reiterate and harden and grow? Perhaps we are in for an age of crisis. I would ask you to consider, of all of these trends, demographics, finance, labor, politics, policy, economic reform, educational reform, Think of which of these are most powerful for shaping your institutions. And then to reconsider which of these is the hardest to predict. Which of these is the most wild card. And to recall that as a futurist, everything I've shown you is in the present. I haven't shown you anything from science fiction. All these future trends are grounded right now in 2017. We want to think about what could come next. I charge you to do that today. Thank you.